Okay, it's time to get this show on the road. Mmm. Mmm. Delicious. Love it. Coffee. It's time to get back to our axe here. Um, this is just part of a series of videos of working with this axe um, out of the store and making some modifications and then using it a bunch for stuff, I guess, is what we're doing. And I am Stephen Edholm from skillcult.com. I've been trying to remember to say that because no one knows my name and people just refer to me as uh, Skill Cult <laughs> on forums and stuff. And I do have a name. Yes, it is Stephen Edholm. Okay, so let's get back to this axe. Now today we're going to talk about just the handle. That's all we're talking about is just the handle and the modifications we're going to make to it. We're not even going to make any and it's going to take a little while to go through this. Now that may seem excessive, but I don't think so. I think it's important that we go through all of the points exactly and why <clears throat> I'm making these certain modifications. And then later on, we will do the head, talk about the head and modifications we're going to make to that. I have a lot fewer ideas about what I want to do with the head and I feel like I have a lot less understanding of that whole problem. But, um, you know, it's all an experiment, so we'll see how that goes. So let's say about the handle, things I like first. Uh, the wood seems solid. It's got an excellent excellent uh, grain orientation and it runs right through the handle pretty much. Um, very good. The growth rings are rather wide. Uh, people will talk about tighter growth rings being better. I have not accepted that as true. I always assume the same thing and then Tim Baker, the bow maker, told me that he preferred wide growth rings on hardwoods. Similarities between bows and axe handles, we want them both to flex without breaking and then spring back to shape. It's not varnish. That's nice. We don't have to scrape off the varnish uh, in order to oil it. It's not heavily oiled, but that's fine. They should either leave the handles raw or put a light coat of oil on them. This probably was just wiped with a light coat of oil. I can't really tell. I like the length. It's 26 inches, which is one inch longer than my Grand Sports Brooks Forest Axe, which is very similar. We're going to be making some comparisons here. And I like that. I like that extra inch. And also the way this, this end is designed, it makes it even a little bit longer. And I'm just going to milk as much length out of I can, as I can by modifying this end here to get out. And that's good because we're going to lose about a half inch moving this head back down. I also like the fact that the handle is not too curved. You can see that it's a real nice gentle curves. You can imagine like if this was a big drastic S curve like this and you tried to use it, how easily that would break because you're just violating and cutting through the grain constantly. So another extreme would be is if the wood fibers came out of this handle straight and then continued in a perfect straight line all the way to the other end of the handle. That would be the ideal strong, um, you know, orientation. Yeah, those are things I like. It kind of looks like this wasn't really designed for this ax, or at least it was poorly designed. Let's just say that if, if uh, I tasked an employee to design a handle for this head, and this is what they designed, they'd be looking for a new job. Because this is just not, I, I feel sure that I could make a pattern uh, by modifying this that would fit this head better. This thickness right here is pretty much equivalent to the thickness of the ax head, and it, it should be a little bit less, um, just because you can imagine how vulnerable this is, uh, depending on what you're doing with the ax. So since these leers are <laughs> Leers. I just need more coffee. So since these ears are leading, right, they're ahead of everything else, they're the thing that's going to stop the, hand, the head from going on further. They are the same diameter inside, though, as the rest of the eye. So they stop the head before it's seated firmly around all up in here. So as a result, there are gaps, uh, good-sized good deep gaps um, here and here and a little bit on the back. So it could be seated better. But the way this is designed, it, you know, it stops that from happening. So with a, taking a little more off here probably would fix that problem. Now, if you're hafting an ax at home, you can take the time to make that work and just, you know, carve the rest of this mess here down too. But in the factory, it, like, it needs to be just like they need to spend like a, a minute, you know, hanging this thing and driving a wedge in it and getting it out the door. So. It just could be done better. Uh, the main thing for me is just this is so ridiculously thick and this isn't really designed to accommodate these ears um, in any way. And also it should be closer to this shoulder right here. 
and I'm thinking we're gonna move it down about a half an inch and then I'm actually gonna recarve the handle so the shoulder is, is closer up in here too. And this is no accident, like someone made this handle pattern very specifically and it's copied exactly on a lathe. You know, I don't know how they do it now, but this is how they used to do it. And if, even, if, even if it's a computer model, you know, that is the pattern, it's the same thing. It's like there's a pattern and it's copied exactly. And if it comes out not fitting well, then it should be redesigned um, to fit better. I don't know what other people's experiences are, but everything I saw in the store had the same problem where the head was hafted way too high up here on the handle and it really needs to come down. So that's gonna take some time. So what I'm saying is I'm not just being nitpicky. It's like this comes out of the factory. My whole point with this ax is that it's not an out of the box solution. It comes out of the factory um, like this and it needs a bunch of work. And if it was just designed better in the first place, it would at least be usable for beginners um, and people that don't know what to do with it or don't have, haven't developed, haven't like worked with axes enough to have developed an opinion about what to do with it and are, you know, ready to grab a rasp and, and uh, whatever tools you need and get in there and do it. <clears throat> um, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this video because that way, you know, people who find themselves in that position and have one of these that's not put together very well, they can go ahead and feel maybe a little more confident to attack it with uh, some tools and make it better. Okay, so with that said, let's move on to the specific points. So if possible, I'm gonna actually remove this head. That's the plan at this point. And I'll probably try to jump it further on by hitting the end of the handle and it should jump the ax head further on because that's gonna make it easier for me to get this off. You see that circular wedge? That's gonna be really hard to get out. I, I'm kind of skeptical that I can get it out, but I have nothing to lose to try because we have an extra eighth of an inch of wood right here. If we're gonna move this down half inch, if I could just get it down a quarter inch, I'll have three eighths of an inch here to work with to get the wedges out and get the head off. Why do I want to take the head off? Uh, first of all, it's easier to work on the head and there's some stuff I want to do filing that might, um, it might just be easier if the head is off. It will also allow me, it'll be easier for me to hang the head by taking it on and off and working on the handle a little bit and seeing like once I get it off, I can see where it's touching the handle when it goes on and where it's not. So I know like which points to take down and which points to leave alone and not touch um, to get a better fit. So various reasons like that. But here's another one. So remember I said that these little wings are the limiting factor, right? They're leading the way and then eventually they bottom out in some like thick part of the handle and they stop. Now, of course, I could sit here and carve that out and get it to go on further and further. But my idea is to actually taper the inside of the ear as a, at a slope like this so we can get at least an extra little bit of it sliding up onto this ramp right here and fitting nicely and without having to carve down the area as much. So that's just an experiment I want to try. The other thing is, and I'd, I'd really like to hear what anyone else thinks about this. I'm going to take this off. I don't know why, I just don't like it on there. Oh, by the way, this uh, this held an edge pretty well. Um, I cut up that whole tree, didn't touch it up. I haven't touched it with a strop and it'll still carve like, you know, shave wood pretty easy. I mean, it's not razor sharp or anything, but it's got a nice edge on it. So that was encouraging. Anyway, where were we? Okay, I'd really like to hear what uh, anyone else thinks about this or what you guys do for you ax people out there. And I think it's a good idea to round the inside bottom of the eye edge on the bottom here. Um, so as it comes from the factory, usually that'll be a sharp edge. In fact, sometimes it'll have, uh, not infrequently, it'll have a burr on it even, not, not just be sharp. But I like to take that and just round just the very edge um, a little bit. And my reasoning on that is that if, if this is, has like a heavy impact from the side or from either end, the wood is pushing against a sharp edge. So what if you took like a stick, let's say, and you hit it against a sharp 90 degree piece of metal like this, and then you took the same stick and, you know, hit it against a very slightly rounded edge, which one's going to do more damage, obviously you know the answer to that. So I do that. Now, I think some people think of it as an advantage to have that edge because it cuts its way onto the handle and it'll sort of shape, you'll see it shaving 
wood out of the way as it moves down the handle. But you know, then you're left with this sharp edge situation and you can get the same fit by just taking your time with, you know, scraping with a knife or a piece of broken glass to get a nice tight fit on there. So I'd like to do that as well. And especially I'd like to taper these ears and just do that experiment because that'll allow the handle to retain a nice even taper coming up like this. Um, without having to carve out basically a space for these eyes. So imagine, imagine it like you have a cylinder like this and you have a cone, a cone shape, and you're putting the cylinder over the cone. If the cylinder is perfectly round and the cone's perfectly round, and they're, or they're a perfect fit, whatever shape they are, it's going to just stop and bottom out and touch all the way around the edge of the cone here. Now, if this, if this cylinder has ears coming out, Imagine what's going to happen, right? The ears bottom out and then the whole cylinder can't go on any further and it's going to have all this space and wobble. That's exactly what's happening here. Okay, let's move on. This is too big um, for this size of head. So we have that problem, but it's also too big to use um, to really grip comfortably. And it also has this thing where this comes way up to a point and then way down. And again, it's more than is needed for this accent. Again, this is made on a pattern, a very specific pattern, and it should be able to be made to pretty tight tolerance. So this is just a bad design. It does not need to come way up in the back like this and then come down. This is a multi-purpose forest axe, right? Is it or isn't it? It's a packable axe that you can do a lot of different things with. And one of those things is carving and hewing. If you're trying to work up here like this, look at that. It's this totally unworkable. This is way too big and I took it out just to compare to this, which is modified by the way. <clears throat> this is the Grand Swords Brooks uh, Small Forest Axe. This I can work with, it feels okay. It's not ideal, I would never design a carving hatchet with this wide um, of a, an area right here. And as you can see, this is not much wider than the eye. It doesn't really get much bigger after it leaves the eye. And that's what we're gonna go for on this handle. So I would never design a carving hatchet like this. I'm just saying that this is workable. You know, this is a, it's a compromise. It's not, it's not a carving hatchet, it's, it's an ax, but it needs to be usable for a lot of different things. This is frankly unusable out of the box. I mean, I took these two out just to hack on some pieces of wood to kind of feel it out. And with this right away, I started getting fatigued and cramped in my hand because I can't close my hand, you know? I can't close it, it looks like this monkey paw kind of shape. The other thing I noticed with these two axes is that you know this handle is quite a bit lighter because it's not as bulky and thick as this one, and it's also an inch shorter. When I was swinging this, I could really feel the drag of all this weight back here, and we're gonna thin the whole handle, so we should be able to improve that. Well, there's two things happening, and they're both uh, inertia. So inertia, a lot of people think of as just the law that says that something that still doesn't want to move like you say oh you know i have inertia because you're sitting on the couch eating potato chips and you don't want to get up and go cut a cord of wood with an axe and you, and you should that's exactly what you should do so inertia is not only the tendency of a body that's still to stay still right like if you have a a bowling ball and it's still like you have to add energy in it to get it going but once it's going it doesn't want to stop and that's the other side of inertia is inertia is also there's like like movement inertia but it doesn't want to stop so i have all this extra stress um, in both cases i have to get the axe going and then i have to stop it at the end of the stroke and i think that again can be improved by just you know reducing this entire mass as much as possible um, and still retaining you know its functionality okay now this isn't talked about all that much but it will be talked about more in the future like for instance I don't recall any review I watched about this axe that mentioned that this handle was too thick um, and I just think it plainly is too thick I mean it, you can say it's it's subjective and it's a matter of opinion but it's hard for me to see it that way honestly you know most most of the writers if not all of them um, from the 20th century on axes will mention that handles should not be too thick. This is this is exactly what they would be talking about. I think if they saw this they would roll their eyes and laugh their asses off but I think they're all dead. So Candle shock is the main reason so if you use this for a long period of time 
every time you hit something with this, a certain amount of energy is transferred back into your hands, no matter what, unless you let completely go of it. So it's just a matter of how much of that energy is transferred back and how much is eaten up by the handle simply just you know vibrating and shaking back and forth after you hit something. So a thinner handle is going to transfer less energy. Let's imagine that we have three rods that are three quarters of an inch thick. One is steel, one is wood, one is um, let's say hard rubber. You slam the steel pipe, you slam the piece of wood, you slam the piece of rubber, and obviously the steel pipe is going to transfer much more shock back into your arms. I mean you won't be able to do that for very long. If you don't use an axe for very long periods of time, you may never notice that. And also not having a reference for using a, an axe with a thinner handle. But let me tell you a story. So this is kind of a diversion, but when I bought this about 18 years ago, I think, and they were affordable then, I went into the trade tent and I looked at it and I thought, what the hell is with this thick ass handle? <laughs> um, I just, you know, I had already probably never bought an axe handle even from the hardware store and they came a lot thinner than these did that I didn't thin down somewhat and tune up. So I looked at it and I was like what the hell is with the thick handle on these? I mean they looked really cool but and I thought well it doesn't matter to me right I'll just take a rasp and thin it down the way I want it. So I remember asking people like someone was there I think Dave Westcott or maybe Steve Watts was in the tent and I was like what's up with this you know thick handles and they were like I don't know you know. So I had a thousand mile drive home. I had just gotten Lyme disease on that trip or like just before the trip. It was just a, a really bad time and I was really sick and I had no idea why. I was super exhausted. The way I imagine it is I would get home, immediately take a rasp to this and thin it out and then, and then go try it. And then on the way home, I was like, okay, well, supposedly these guys have been making axes for like 16 billion years or whatever. And maybe they know what they're talking about and I should just like bitch slap my ego and go out and try it the way it is. So I took it out, again, feeling terrible. I was very sick and very low energy. And I kind of like stumbled out into the woods and <laughs> took a few blows with this thing on a tree. And I was like, yeah, it's terrible. It's just exactly what I expected. It was a, you know, lifeless, thudding, clunky piece of crap. Um, it's a beautiful handle. I mean, it was beautifully made and it's great wood. So I just stumbled back home. I grabbed my rasp and I thinned this area out just to like make it usable, basically. I remember my whole thought process on this. It was just like, okay, I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to make this usable. So it's sitting around and I can, I can use it and try it again. So I thinned this out kind of the way a uh, ball peen ha hammer is thinned out, like right up here near the head. And then I went back out and I was like, yeah, okay, that's better. And it was a huge improvement. And I, for, for whatever reasons, I've never touched it since. And lately I haven't touched it because I wanted to use it as an example in a video like this and tell the story. And now I probably won't change it because it's got this beautiful patina and I can sell it for more with this patina because this ax is supposed to replace this ax. It's longer and it's made better. This is extremely crooked. What's the story? Okay, so now we continue the story. Now it's next year and I'm cutting all my firewood with an axe, a cord, and I cut the first third of a cord with this. Actually, I know cutting more, more than a third of a cord with this. And the reason is I was just like, what is this capable of? I mean, what is this little axe? It's probably less than a two pound head, only a 25 inch handle. I was like, what if, you know, what if I had to build a cabin? What if I had to cut all of my firewood with this? What would that be like? And I don't feel like I get a good feel for that or I can say with any authority or confidence, credibility saying that saying this without having just done like a, a real quantity of wood so i cut a third of a quarter wood with this into 16 inch lengths yeah the conclusion is yes this is this can do a lot of serious work no it's not the best tool for the job yes it's going to take longer but it can do it and it, it can do it pretty competently. That, that's exactly what this class of axe is about. And so we're, we'll get back to that some other time. I'm cutting firewood with this and I remember at a couple points after maybe like 40 minutes or more of using it, I remember like going to picking the axe back up out of a cut and being ready to go and just being like, my body was just like, don't hit that again. You know, don't hit that again. And it wasn't like an intellectual process where I'm like, oh, you know, I'm thinking about the whole thing. It was just a visceral reaction from my hands and wrists that was just like, don't hit that again. 
because it's going to hurt. <laughs> and I started, I remember just, I just kept going and I was kind of like, just lightened up on my grip as much as possible and took gentler blows. You know, it was like working my wrists and hands because of all this vibration coming back up the handle. It's like you hit the tree and the tree bites you back, basically. It's not just that but it feels way better. Like if you get used to using a thin handle that's, that feels lively and has some flex to it, it's, it's nice. It's just nice. It's hard to explain it, but this is not there. You know, this helps a lot. Like, like don't get me wrong, this helps a whole lot, but it's just not enough and this needs to be taken down um, more. Let me just compare to this boy's ax. Okay, you ready for this? This is a boy's ax. I did scrape it down and rasp it down a little bit, but you know, this isn't too much thinner than this came out of the factory. And I want you to make a comparison here between these two. Look at that. <laughs> Look at the difference. Oh my God, it's ridiculous. And from the side here too. And, and we're talking about the same size of head, probably a little heavier on this, this uh, Craftsman Boys Axe. The eye is also smaller on this a little bit too. Big difference. I think I think this is what's really happened here is that people, old people from old times were just really dumb and they hadn't figured out that if you make an ax handle really, really thick, it won't break. So that's, that's what it is. And it's a good thing that all those dumb old people died from the way back times because otherwise we'd have to use these terrible thin handles that break all the time and use half the, half the amount of hickory trees to make. So I'm not going to belabor that point anymore. Um, suffice to say that I'm right and, you know, Peter Vito's right and Dudley Cook's right and Horace Kephart's right and probably Kreps and whoever else was writing about axes in the 20th century. And, you know, pretty soon this is just going to be standard fare. People are going to stop accepting this crap as it comes out of the factory and they're going to like, you know, take some tools to this. And if that gets back eventually to the manufacturers, maybe they'll change and give us this thing out of the freaking factory as a usable ax or at least closer you know it's okay to have to do some work it's a it's a cheaper ax i'm just talking about stuff that they're they're going to do the same amount of work but they're going to output a better product whether having a thick handle like this actually protects the handle against breakage or not i'm totally unconvinced on that point uh you had a conversation on axe junkies i'm sorry i can't remember the guy's name um, where he was saying that he thinks thick handles are a major cause of breakage rather than the other way around because they don't flex. Now, I think that's quite possible. I can say that if you go to real extremes where the handle is super thick and then it thins down and the eye is the thinnest point, I think that puts stress on the eye area, which is often where they'll break. Anyway, um, I don't think it's necessary and you don't want to, you know, dumb the thing down so much that you sacrifice its functionality in order just to make it last longer. I think that's the wrong direction for us to be headed in. Okay, so I think that's enough for, for the, the candle thing. I'm definitely gonna talk about it more in other places because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine and I just feel like it needs to be discussed more. It's not being discussed enough. So let's talk about the butt. One of the first things I'm gonna do before I do anything is I'm gonna put a stronger bevel around this butt right here. Well, I want to see about a quarter of an inch wide. This is about maybe an eighth or a little more. And that's gonna protect the handle if it's beaten on, even if it's beaten on with wood, the more this, to an extent, the more that this is beveled, the more it's gonna be protected. Now, if you didn't have any bevel at all like this, um, you'd very likely chip out pieces of wood off the edge here. And the more it's beveled to an extent, the stronger it's gonna be. So I'm just gonna add a little bit. It may not be necessary, but it certainly isn't gonna hurt anything at all. And it's just more, you know, it's insurance. So that, I'm gonna do that right away. Then the one thing I wanted to do, really wanted to do, and I kept staring at this thing on the wall before I ever took it out even once, was I wanted to make this into more of a hook, more similar to this, because I could just see the shape. Imagine grabbing that and look, look how, as, as my hand slides up, my pinky comes way up. Look, it's like standing up high. Now that is really causes a lot of friction and um, pressure here. And I got a blister very quickly from this right here. And it's slightly ridged as well. So I think bringing that down, rounding it a little, flattening it a little more and making it more of a hook. Also that way, 
it's going to provide more of a stop. Like I remember one time using this, I missed something. Um, like I missed a limb or I, I think I might have glanced off of a log and the axe just shot, you know, out like this. And I remember it just, the axe swinging way around and just the only thing that kept my grip on it was the fact that this hook is so strong. And I thought, well, that's great because if I hadn't had this, like if I'd had this axe, I'm sure it would have flown out of my hand. And it, obviously if someone was around, that would be really dangerous. And um, yeah, so I like this design much better. And so I'm gonna make it similar to that. And I'm also gonna take this as far down here as I can get away with to get as much handle length as I can, especially since we're gonna lose about a half an inch up here. Okay, so let's go back up here and there's something I forgot to talk about, which is the fact that I'm actually gonna level this off more and take some of this down, down a little ways. As soon as I get the head on where I want it, I don't really need the handle to ramp up the way it does now. It ramps up this way, then it ramps up this way. And that is there, that taper, that cone shape is there so that as the head goes on, it gets tighter and tighter, right? So it's there for that reason. But once the head is really seated and really seated well, we don't really need that. If anything, you could just leave a tiny bit in case that ax head ever needs to be driven on further to tighten it, probably by someone else other than me, you know, in the future, but it's not really necessary. So once I get this on as far as I want it and establish it, I actually want the, the wood to come out of the eye and just go straight basically, because that's gonna be the strongest configuration. Right now what we have is we have this dip in this cut right here. So the fibers are coming this way, they're traveling kind of up, and then this cuts them off. So there's, there's fibers being cut off and ending right here in this area. And as much as possible, we wanna eliminate that and make all these transitions smooth. The other thing I haven't mentioned yet is that this is extremely sharp. So why is that sharp? Because this ax head has a sharp V in the eye right here. It's not rounded off like this. It comes to a sharp V rather than being rounded on the end. So you can imagine how vulnerable that is. If you have a sharp piece of wood and you hit it with something, it's gonna break much easier than if you hit like back here where it's a rounded off piece of wood. So that's a really important reason why this head needs to go on further. There's really no way around that. It needs to go on further, cover up, cover up more of this sharp edge, and then what's left, I'll be able to round off and get it a little bit more rounded. It doesn't matter. It matters a lot. I hit this uh, on a branch in the dark and it's already damaged because it's just so sharp, it just can't take any abuse. And what'll happen is it'll splinter and splinter and eventually it'll kind of round itself off effectively and then it will be less vulnerable to damage but of course it'll be all broken and messed up head goes on further cover up more of this sharp edge round this off but still even with that i want a wrap on this and i don't really put wraps on most of my axes but i they're cool and i'm into them as long as they're done right and the main thing for me the main criteria and we'll talk about we'll get more into the specifics of that when we actually do it but basically i don't want anything in the way like i don't want to i want to barely notice that there's anything here if um you know people will wrap these with paracord i think that's just terrible because you can't grab it it adds another eighth of an inch of thickness up here uh, maybe more maybe an eighth on each side um, so I don't want anything like that. I don't want anything that, that has heavy friction because I'm gonna handle this right here all the time. Like you'll see me in videos with axes and mauls, I'm always handling it here and I'm swinging the handle around like that because this is the, the balance point where it's like, you know, it's more, it's easy to handle up here and you're not, if you're holding it out here all the time when you're not working, it's just a stress. If you wanna move it anywhere, you have to lift all this weight. But if your hand's here, then it just like balances and rotates around this point right here. So I don't want anything in the way of that is what I'm saying. And also every, pretty much every stroke, you're picking your hand up and you're grabbing the ax here to take your next stroke. So if there's something in the way, it's gonna interfere with like your hand. Just I just want this all smooth so my hand can slide easily up and down and I'm not noticing that there's anything here in my way. So for that reason, I will probably use rawhide for this. That's gonna look cool too. Okay, two more things. I wanna put a rule on here. So it's gonna be marked every three inches probably, uh, maybe more even, but at least every three inches with bigger marks at six and even bigger marks at 12, and then maybe a, a, a real obvious big mark or an arrow or something at 16, because I'll be cutting a lot of 16 with this uh, probably. And 
Yeah, put a ruler on it. Not sure I'm gonna do that. I might burn it in. I'm not really sure yet. Okay, finally, we're gonna saturate this with linseed oil. I'd like to see this saturated with like, you know, up to an eighth of an inch deep. I mean, more wouldn't hurt or anything, but that's kind of what I'm shooting for. And every piece of wood's different, so you just have to go for it. But the basically all you really need to know is for, you know, the way I do it is, just keep hitting, putting linseed oil on it in a warm area, keep the handle warm as long as it keeps soaking it up. And when it starts to slow down and you'll see it sit on the surface for a long period of time, you can let that cure for a while, then put on a final thin coat, let that cure, and if you want to build it up from there, you can put a thin coat on every time that the top coat cures. The next video, we'll take that head off and do the modif at least the modifications we need to get it hung on the handle in a way that's more functional and, you know, just actually works because the way it is now, it, it does not work well. It's probably going to work loose because the head isn't driven on tight enough. And we have, you know, I don't know if you can see that there's some gaps in here, but, you know, I can stick stuff in there, down in there. And, you know, there'll be a couple more videos, probably another one that's just working on the wood part of the handle. We'll see how many it takes. It's just going to be a kind of a process we'll follow through slowly and then we'll get out and use the thing some more too, maybe uh, at intervals between modifying it and just in the end just to use it a bunch and see how it's doing and what we can do with it.